Hello, 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 and welcome to the show. Let me just change that. We've got a mirror there. Yeah, I think that's fine. You can tell that I'm flying blind today by myself. You may have noticed me do this occasionally, and it doesn't always work out for the best. Let's just put it mildly. Um, today, we are talking a very impromptu show, but an important show, because we are talking about the Northern Ireland deal, which has just been announced with great aplomb by Rishi Sunak, who is, you may have forgotten, I occasionally do, the Prime Minister of the country. It's the Windsor framework. Now, Northern Ireland peace is, I think, one of the most sacred achievements of the last 30, 40 years in this country. Whatever disagreements I have with New Labour, which I've listed at length, it was one of their great achievements. It ended a conflict which took the lives of three and a half thousand people on both sides, of course, of um, in terms of what Ireland and on the UK as in the UK as well, um, a pretty gruesome conflict which was brought to an end by a lasting peace. And part of that Good Friday Agreement was that whilst Northern Ireland would remain part of the UK, though with the potential for a referendum in the future to change that status, there would be a porous border between the North and the South. Slight hitch. We had a referendum. Remember that? And we left the European Union which then opened the question of what the hell happens given Northern Ireland is outside of the EU and the Republic of Ireland is within. Now, we're going to talk about that, the Northern Ireland Protocol, which was set up in the aftermath, but there has been lasting tension over this because of a border between it down the Irish Sea. Theresa May famously said no British Prime Minister could ever agree, given she was, of course, the Prime Minister of the Conservative and Unionist Party, its full name, so a border down the Irish Sea. Boris Johnson... I mean, he went and claimed that he got this great new spanking deal from the EU. The reason for that was he changed the red lines, and that red lines included doing what Theresa May, said, Theresa May said no British Prime Minister could do, which was to agree to a de facto border down the Irish Sea. Now, we're going to talk about this, what the deal is, and all the rest of it. Let's just hear what Rishi Sunak had to say in the House of Commons. After weeks of negotiations today, we have made a decisive breakthrough. The Windsor framework delivers free-flowing trade within the whole United Kingdom. It protects Northern Ireland's place in our union and it safeguards sovereignty for the people of Northern Ireland. Yeah, yeah. By achieving all this, it preserves the delicate balance inherent in the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. And Mr Speaker, it does what many said could not be done, removing thousands of pages of EU laws and making permanent legally binding changes to the Protocol Treaty itself. That is the breakthrough we have made. Those are the changes we will deliver. And now is the time to move forward as one united kingdom. Yeah. Mm, well, he's pretty chipper about the whole thing, isn't he? Interesting. There's lots there to consider, of course, in terms of the balance of forces within the Conservative Party. The Democratic and Unionist Party, who, of course, have dominated unionism since they eclipsed the traditional uh, flag bearers of Ulster unionism, the Ulster Unionist uh, Party. Um, the DUP came under significant challenge. They've Their own position has, like their predecessor, massively declined in the last um, elections. And, of course, because of the divisions within the Unionist Party, Sinn Féin emerged as the biggest party, both in the North and leading the polls in the South. So there's a huge amount there to consider. Later, we're talking to Colin Murray, who I can see is there waiting for us. I'm very excited about that. We, we, we were, the reason we're slightly delayed, we're just going to occasionally have tech issues we have to confront. But I think I'm confident we've got Colin um, to speak to in about uh, 12 minutes or so. First, what we're going to do, if you're watching live, do click on the YouTube link, press like and subscribe. Do leave comments. Always fascinating to leave your comments. Do support us on patreon.com forward slash ownjoes84. That keeps the show on the road. And you can use Super Chat. I will thank everybody at the end, but I will also put questions to our distinguished guests. Let's start with Dimitri. Hey, hey, buddy. How you doing? All good. How are you? Are you in space, Dimitri? Uh, in so many ways. Uh, <laughs> this is... Well, it's it's Elon Musk's Twitter. Once you're over about ten thousand followers, he just blasts you to Mars. What a perk! That is a real perk. I've not used that yet. I have to say, I know that is obviously an offer. Everyone knows about the space for uh, feature. Um, for those of you, sorry, if you're listening on the podcast, Dimitri just has a black background. That's the only reason I've suggested he may well be orbiting, but I don't think he actually is. I think he's live from <laughs> Earth. Dimitri. Tell, what do you think about this? Is this actually a massive breakthrough? I mean, you've only not had much time to look at this, um, but we were promised an oven ready deal, of course, by Boris Johnson. Is this now an oven ready deal, do you think? So, I mean, 
look to, to put this into perspective this the deal alone is a combined kind of 60 pages once you factor in all of the eu legislation that makes it real the numbers climb into the hundreds we've all had this for about two or three hours and to give you an indication of how geeky and small the community reading this is me and your next guest have never met but we are separately in the same in dungeons and dragons games with the same person who is also reading this deal so this is not like there's a lot of complexity here and it's a lot to wade through but what this deal appears to be is a breakthrough in the sense of a salvage operation the way that the uk the way that the northern ireland protocol operates effectively put a border in the irish sea that is a problem uh, that is a problem for people on both sides of the border. It's a problem politically and it's a problem practically, like for supermarkets. If somebody put a big old border between your little and wherever it gets a, its stuff from, that would very quickly be a problem for you. So that kind of, that was always premised on this idea that we have to have a border somewhere. The only place we can agree to put it is in the Irish Sea. And the way that the UK and EU will handle that is by saying that goods that are headed to the EU will be subject to EU rules, EU tariffs, and so on. And goods that are staying in Northern Ireland will be able to get waived through. What this deal does is keeps that fundamental principle, but it appears at first reading to significantly shift the needle on how many of the goods that are headed to Northern Ireland are considered to be staying there and don't have to jump through a thousand hoops to prove that they're not headed into the European Union and thus can just kind of cross the border. So from that perspective, it's a really big deal in practice. But if your red line was political to begin with, like any border is a crime, then it doesn't fundamentally solve that. I mean, do you think he's managed something which is which some might have suggested, he said himself in his speech, this was seen as impossible. And do you think actually, well, let me go, maybe you're wincing a bit, so maybe that suggests you didn't think that was actually impossible. But if he, do you think it's possible he has ended up with a deal which can satisfy the DP, Tory Brexiteers, but also though, you know, for example, Sinn Féin, for example, or for example, those, you know, who aren't the kind of arch Brexiteers within the Conservative Parliamentary Party, notwithstanding a lot of the other ones were kind of kicked out. So that was actually my thinking face, uh, not my in pain face, ah. but the two are very similar. Um, the it was it would certainly have been a deal that was really difficult to achieve immediately after Brexit, given the way that the Tory party's rhetoric and political positioning was set up. So what I mean by that is immediately after sort of Brexit, and I'm talking about kind of 2018, 2019, 2020, everybody was looking at everything exclusively through the lens of within the Tory party of does this undo Brexit? The ERG, the hardliners within the Tory party had something like 80 members. And so we're in a position to make or break prime ministerships. And the everybody was ceaselessly performing screw the EUism. Like it was all about how much could I demonstrate my Brexit credentials. Under those circumstances, coming to the EU, even with a deal like this, the EU would be looking at that going, we don't have the trust in you that you will do all of the things that we need to make this work. And we think that at the first opportunity, you will performatively diverge from our rules and potentially get things into our market that shouldn't be there because your posturing is so aggressive, confrontational, and there are so clearly points to be scored at home by just, look, we're doing something the EU doesn't do. All of that has faded away now somewhat. The ERG is a shell of its former self. Um, the DUP looks like it's gotten in line with this. Um, Sunak, while in an incredibly weak position nationally, appears to be in a position to push um, to push this deal through his own membership. So, and the tone of the relationship with the EU is vastly improved. So, it's a deal that would have been impossible 
while everybody was at DEFCON 1 dunking on the EU at every opportunity and trying to bully them into submission. It's a deal that is apparently possible today. I'm wondering if this shows the balance of forces has shifted in the way that which which people haven't really noticed because it, it's not something which happened suddenly. But in, what I mean by that is, in theory, you should think that it sh- the, the Tory Brexit is the hardcore ones are a lot stronger than they were under, say, Theresa May. Um, because in, in the sense that in Theresa May, you had a whole parliament, which I suppose actually gave them more leverage in that sense. But um, under Boris Johnson, 21 were kicked out of the parliamentary party. He tended to be more remainy. You had then Boris Johnson won a 80-seat majority in the 2019 election, bringing in a lot more hardcore Brexiteers who won seats, for example, in the Red Wall. But what's happened since is because the Brexit deal has frankly proven to be, I think, increasingly unpopular in terms of its... Or it's certainly not delivered what many people who are enthusiastic but wanted. So that Brexit enthusiasm has quietly subsided, or the more kind of fanatical end has subsided. And even though Rishi Sunak, in theory, should be a very, very weak prime minister, because the Tories at the moment on about 22 points in the opinion polls, um, you should think that's an existential crisis, which should have his opponents strengthened within. But actually... The Brexiteers are exhausted intellectually and politically, and they don't therefore have the leverage you might anticipate they once had. Is that what's happened, do you think? They've just, their power's drained away. I think the end conclusion is correct. I think a couple of things have happened. First, under Theresa May, there was this sense that Brexit might be reversed. I don't think it was ever actually at risk. The Labour Party was not going to reverse it. The Conservatives weren't going to reverse it. And nobody can name the leader of the Lib Dems, so who cares? Um, Like, there was no actual threat to Brexit, but it could be painted as it's about to reverse the referendum. And people took, people, I think many voters separated the idea of reversing the referendum from Brexit itself. And that has completely faded away. The UK is out of the European Union. There is no chance it's coming back. With for many, many years, that's not on the cards. So that's faded away. The issue is generally drained away. And Brexit itself is significantly less popular than it was. So I think these ERG guys, and you saw this a lot during Boris Johnson's steady decline into deep unpopularity, was that they kept trying to do what they did under May, which was bang the rally to us to save Brexit. Whatever current scandal is in the news is a attempt to undo Brexit, like this is Ramona's yada, yada, yada. And it just gradually stopped working. Like they rang the Brexit bells and just like nobody turned up except spectator columnists. Mm. Mm. Um, And and so it didn't, like it didn't matter as much. So Mm. like fundamentally, I think the conclusion is the ERG, while theoretically maybe, I don't know what, like Sunak is weak, but the ERG... Nobody's listening to them anymore. No. Um, and, and that in politics matters. I mean, Steve Baker, who is an MP very associated, obviously, with that particular wing of the Conservative Party, he's already gone on record to say he will support this particular deal. I think that that suggests, I mean, that kind of speaks to what you're saying. I don't think even if he had problems with it, he feels he's politically in a position to do so. But do you think there are ele- elements of, it's very early days, but hours even, but do you think there are elements that they would actually or should take issue with based on their own position? I mean, if your fundamental position, as they say that it is, is that any kind of border is fundamentally unacceptable, Mm -hmm. any application of EU Mm -hmm. law um, on effectively subjects of the United Kingdom in Northern Ireland is unacceptable, any kind of role for um, for the ECJ is, is unacceptable, then this deal doesn't quite pass those tests on a matter of principle. And I should say, like, lawyers are digging into exactly what it does on things like state aids or subsidies and exactly how far it goes. Um, But I think those were always kind of, those are positions of principle, not necessarily practical effect. Mm -hmm. There are these meta questions about democracy. Mm -hmm. Like, let me give you a really, really clear example. Um, The way that Uh, This deal includes something called a Stormont Lock, which is basically that the Northern Ireland Assembly can, uh, if if there is a new 
if there's a new EU legislation or an amended EU rule that would significantly change life for people in Northern Ireland, mm -hmm. the Northern Ireland Assembly can now make a recommendation to London, and then London can effectively veto that going into power, um, at which point they enter into negotiations in the Joint Committee. And if they can't resolve it there, instead of the ECJ getting the final word, there is an independent arbitration tribunal that decides it. So not the ECJ, but the UK names some judges, the EU yeah. names some yeah. judges, they mutually agree a champion. Now, if for you the difference between democracy and not democracy is a panel of EU-appointed judges looking at EU law versus a panel of which only half were appointed by the EU mm -hmm. looking at EU law, mm -hmm. then, okay, then th this kind of, th this makes a huge difference. But I think fundamentally, this is going to make it a lot easier to get a lot of stuff into Northern Ireland that probably should be there, which is good. Um, I should just say, someone in the comments said Steve Baker's bound by collective responsibility, which is true in a sense. He's Minister of State for Northern Ireland, um, but he was the former chair, of course, of the European <laughs> Research Group. I'm, I'm, surprised, I'm surprised on this podcast you would use the Tories and responsibility in the same sentence. I know, yeah. Uh, without adding is... criminal or something, I don't know. Like, <laughs> uh, aren't you violating a statute? I mean, it should. It, there should be a statute making that clear. Mm. There should have been some big red thing yeah. flashing, an alarm flashing when I mentioned that. But you're right. I mean, he. But the point I was making, he could resign, and he's not going to resign. Is the point I was going to make? Just, just finally, Dimitri. Then, I mean, before I bring in, um, I'll, I'll bring in Colin. And let you go. But do you think this? I mean, this. I don't know what your views are. I don't. You don't have to go into whether you think Boris Johnson can be prime minister again. I still think he could be after the May elections. But the point I was making is Boris Johnson. I think and was was banking on this going badly wrong, and this being a crisis point where he could become prime minister again. But I suppose the reason I'm suggesting it might, from your perspective as a former diplomat and, and general all-round Brexit expert, is I suppose the Boris Johnson position would be, well, you've got to basically, you know, growl at the EU like a growling, big, angry Rottweiler. And that's how you get um, concessions from the EU. And I suppose the argument, the reason he's kind of a bit discredited now is this suggests that actually if you work in a more diplomatic and conciliatory way with the EU, then you get more concessions. Do you, do you think that's right? But the other thing, just going on that, maybe do you think the EU also are calculating Brexit is seen as such an international disaster yeah. that these concessions aren't going to weaken that view, um, if that makes sense? Because then it's not like they're thinking, well, we've given all these concessions and that weakens the EU collectively. Yeah, so to, to deal with the first part of the problem, the first part of your question, um, I have banged on about this forever. Others have as well. It's not just a Boris Johnson problem. There is a long line of Brexit kind of leaders in the UK, Johnson, Frost, Davis, um, actually Baker to some extent, uh, Francois, um, and in the US in the form of Trump and others, who basically take this view that the way that you get what you want in a negotiation is by bluster, making threats, attacking people in uh, attacking people in the press, writing hostile op-eds, playing to your base, which they love anyway, because it gets you sort of seal claps from the hardliners, while simultaneously sticking it to them, not giving an inch. That is not how international negotiations basically ever work. Mm -hmm. um, it's not even how hostage negotiations work, <laughs> but it's certainly not how you resolve a question which is fundamentally about trust. This, the whole thing comes down to was the e how much is the EU willing to trust that the UK won't exploit a porous, really easy to transfer border to do one of three things? to performatively diverge, to get things into their market that shouldn't be there, that they're dangerous, or to get things into their market that are subsidized in the UK in ways that hurt uh, EU producers. And all of that is a trust equation. It all comes down to how much are you willing to data share? How much do you just, what's your relationship like? Are you meeting and talking in committees? Mm. And so that was the approach, that was the only approach that was ever going to work because the harder you tried to push the EU, the more from the EU perspective was like, firstly, I don't, if this is the way you're approaching negotiations, 
I don't trust that you're not going to exploit anything we give you. And secondly, we can't, as the European Union, which is, by the way, five times your size and considers itself a major player internationally, be seen to be publicly bullied and browbeaten. Yeah, exactly. We can't reveal that that is the manual to getting what you want out of us. Exactly. And so, yeah, it didn't work. It's never worked. The 50,000 op-eds David Frost has written about how you just need to throw a brick at their heads have always been counterproductive. Mm. And if there is one reason to not bring Boris Johnson back, and I'm sure this podcast, this show would struggle to think of any others, it is that it is a bully Etonian high school Bullingdon club approach to um, how you govern that has never worked anywhere and that, frankly, at his age, he's unlikely to change. Very eloquently and succinctly put there at the end. Dimitri, what a pleasure. Do, by the way, um, listen to Dimitri's uh, podcast, which is Intrigue Explained. Um, if you're watching, you can see that I've put the link in a banner below. So just go and check that out and you can get even more of Dimitri's insights. So yeah, there's a little bonus. No, don't, don't, that's it. That, that's all I have. <laughs> Thanks so much for having me on. Don't it's you. a pleasure to meet you. It was PG soon, but really, really great Thanks to so see much. you. Take care. Bye-bye. Uh, great stuff as ever from Dimitri. I'm going to bring um, Colin Marie straight in, who is Professor of Law and Democracy at Newcastle Law School. How you doing, Colin? How's it going? Hey, Owen. How you doing? Not too bad, not too bad. Now, I just want your, firstly, I'm just interested, your first take on, on what you read of this agreement. Yeah, it's really interesting to follow on from what Dimitri's saying there, because a lot of this agreement is, well, Vaseline Don smiles and a big tone shift. It's all about the vibes. The vibes are nothing but good between Ursula von der Leyen and Rishi Sunak today. And they're both out in in a big selling mode. But that matters because Boris Johnson, immediately with the protocol that he negotiated, tried to start disowning it. He might run the run into the 2019 general election of sold as a brilliant deal and encouraged everyone to vote on that basis that he had got Brexit done. But he pivoted hard away from that with the internal market bill in 2020. Mm-hmm laterally with the protocol bill and there was always an idea that well he was trying to say oh I didn't fully understand what I'd committed to it's really difficult to see anything like that happening in the context of this agreement the Windsor framework which let's face it with its very name is supposed to throw out loads of monarchic vibes that keep unionism in Northern Ireland happy it's very hard to drop, oh, we didn't know what we were signing up to, when, let's face it, UK and EU relations down the line hit another sticky patch. Just in terms of Northern Ireland and what Brexit has meant, because obviously, if we look back to the referendum of 2016, it was barely mentioned. Um, on, not just by the Brexiteers, by Remainers, it just was not a major part of that referendum whatsoever, which is unfortunate because it became one of the defining issues, of course, of the entire debate after the referendum actually happened. Um, so, but actually, it's fair to say this hasn't been bad for Northern Ireland, has it? Actually, the position, it says if you look at the Northern Irish economy, um, it's actually not worked out th- that badly so far, has it? Well, it's really hard to disaggregate at this point, the effects of COVID from the effects of Brexit. Of course. And exactly what's happened to the economy will, will remain to be, well dug out or trade figures for the years ahead. But the issue is the 2019 deal was sold as being this best of both worlds moment when Northern Ireland would have unique access into the EU single market for goods and into the UK's internal market, the remainder of the UK or Great Britain. Now, the problem with that is If you are looking to do external direct investment, if you're a firm and you're thinking about investing, that makes Northern Ireland potentially quite a profitable and interesting place to invest in with unique trading possibilities. And Northern Ireland is an economy that is a periphery on the edge of a peripheral economy in the context of Europe. If the UK is at the fringes of Europe, Northern Ireland is at the fringes of the United Kingdom in this equation. So it needs a way to strengthen economic growth. But what you've had is, since the 2019 deal, years of wrangling. 
And if you're a business, if you're looking to invest, if you're thinking this is the setup, uh, the set of trading rules that we could take advantage of, you're just not going to engage with that if all you see is upheaval. If there is no stability in terms of the platform of rules that are going to come in, and let's face it, it's a market of 1.9 million people. If you think that these rules are going to radically change as Johnson's protocol bill last summer put out, even if you're a Great Britain firm and you traditionally sent goods to Northern Ireland, why would you bother learning the rules to currently do it if those rules are going to be ripped up and changed for a small market? It's just not worth it. So what you've seen is years of compound instability. Mm. And whilst that might not look demonstrably different from the rest of the UK in terms of trading arrangements, because let's face it, lots of things have flatlined in the seven years since the Brexit referendum. Mm. It's not generating any impetus that's going to help the economy in Northern Ireland. That's, let's face it, what, Northern Ireland needs. And perhaps if unionist politicians in Northern Ireland are thinking about Northern Ireland's position within the union, well, protracted instability is not helpful towards that. And so maybe they are looking for an off-ramp at the moment. And this is the bit where or the time where cashing in their chips makes sense. I suppose, I mean, the point I suppose there is for, for businesses, generally uncertainty is the one thing they, they don't like. And this limbo has been uncertainty on a on a, on a grand scale. Yeah. Where, where do you think this leaves Northern Ireland's constitutional position? Um, well, if you like, the whole of the Brexit uncertainty and what you went back to, the lack of discussion of Northern Ireland in the run-up to the referendum and the sudden discovery of it in the aftermath is very much down to an idea of the UK government not fully understanding the UK constitution. And even in recent debates where unionist parties like the DUP and the traditional unionist voice have consistently gone back to the Act of Union of 1800, they haven't even understood mm -hmm. the UK constitution because well, parliamentary sovereignty allows that to be altered. And the European Union always recognised that Northern Ireland's position within the United Kingdom was contingent upon the 1998 Belfast Good Friday Agreement, and it was contingent upon um, the cross-border cooperation that that agreement provided for, and had come to rely very heavily on freedom of movement across that border for goods. That, that was an essential part of cooperation, what came to be called a, an integrated economy across the island of Ireland. And the European Union was very quick to recognise that within the context of the Brexit negotiations. And the UK government was much slower to recognise the implications of that. And so consistently through the May Protocol, through the Johnson Protocol, through now the Sunak Windsor framework, because we're dropping the branding of protocol and it has become so toxic, there's been this effort to come to an understanding of what the UK constitution will accommodate. And it's really useful for Rishi Sunak that just a couple of weeks ago in the Alistair judgment, the Supreme Court turned around and said, well, what the UK constitution will accommodate is what parliament enacts. That there is a lot of scope within parliament to make special arrangements for Northern Ireland. Now that gives the UK government a level of constitutional cover. It can come to a special deal with the EU, and because unionists pushed that case all the way to the Supreme Court, they kind of have to suck up the judgment when you leave it in a grey area, oh, this is a constitutional issue. It can sound like something that becomes a rallying cry for supporters. As soon as you've gone to the High Court and the Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court, and they've all told you, one after the other, that this is constitutionally acceptable. Mm -hmm. And that was the Johnson protocol, not the mm -hmm. mitigated form that we're talking about today. It's really hard to run up that mountain again and push your supporters up it and say, this is a constitutional outrage, because that just doesn't fly anymore. I mean, it is interesting that Ian Paisley Jr., the, of course, the DUP MP, has said that the Windsor Framement does not cut the mustard. It provides no basis for the DUP to go back into the power sharing government. And Rishi Sunet needs to enter fresh negotiations with the EU. I mean, it's interesting, of course, the, the internal traumas of 
of uh, of, un- of also unionism because obviously for those I'm sure lots of people are familiar with the, the a brief history of that unionism but also the unionism uh, was represented by the UUP which then the DUP came up and eclipsed them but now the traditional unionist voice is now nipping at the heels of the DUP and obviously in the last Northern Ireland election uh, the DUP's vote fell by 6.7 percentage points whilst the TUV the more hardline version went up by five percentage points that's probably a direct transfer of um, DEP voters who were uh, basically felt the DEP are selling them down the river. So there's, you know, that's the traditional Ulster unionist position, isn't it? Which is the constant, th- the, the dominant part of unionism is selling unionism down the river. But I'm just interested, what do you think about that in terms of Ian, Ian, Ian Paisley's um, intervention? Well, if you like, in the last year, Jeffrey Donaldson, since he became leader of the DUP, has been trying to, well, defend a crumbling position. He inherited an awful lot of mistakes that were made by his predecessor, Arlene Foster, in squandering a lot of the leverage that the DUP had when they entered a confidence and supply arrangement with Theresa May after the 2017 general election. And the last Stormont Assembly result that you've just read out the results for wasn't actually that bad for the DUP. It managed to cleave quite close to the TUV to not create enough of a difference in position Mm -hmm. that very many voters would go away from it. Mm -hmm. And of course, in a PR single transferable vote system, as existed for Stormont elections, the DUP could afford to lose first preference votes to the TUV and know that those votes would still come back on a second or a third preference. The TUV still only got one member of the Legislative Assembly seat. So even though the headline vote share went down, the DUP didn't hemorrhage seats to its hardline unionist rival. Now, in the context of what's coming up, there's a window of time. It's going to be multiple years if the DUP goes back into Stormont Mm -hmm. before the next Assembly election. So they've maybe got a chance to stabilise the position, make some of these arrangements work again, would be Donaldson's potential hope, and sideline um, the TUV and hopefully not actually start losing seats to it. The whole way that the deal is set up, that it relies upon, as Dimitri is talking about, the petition of concern, really relies upon the DUP not working with the TUV, It has to work with the more moderate Ulster Unionist Party, which wouldn't have um, blocked Stormont from forming at all after the Assembly elections of 2022, Mm -hmm. if it ever wants to trigger that petition of concern. DUP plus TUV does not get enough votes. You need 30 seats in the Assembly to trigger that. So a lot of these arrangements are really pretty carefully calibrated to bring the DUP back to a position where it needs to work in Stormont Mm -hmm. to get this to happen. And it can't simply sit out. If you like, if it tries to sit out again, all of these arrangements, well, they fall by the wayside. There is no petition of concern mechanism Mm -hmm. that happens. And the protocol or its Windsor framework incarnation just continues to rumble down the road. So abstentionism just doesn't cut it at the moment. Now, the interesting thing is some DUP figures, like Ian Paisley Jr., are clearly on manoeuvres. They lost out when Edwin Putz had a really brief tenure as DUP leader a couple of years ago, and it was so disastrous that it lasted less time than Liz Truss lasted in leadership. And Jeffrey Donaldson came in. There is a potential weakness in his position that perhaps the DUP might fracture, perhaps some of those people who were never really signed up to Jeffrey Donaldson being leader of the DUP will try to manoeuvre against him at this point. Just lastly, there's quite an interesting acerbic comment from Tad Campwell. He says the Good Friday Agreement was called the Sunningdale Agreement um, for slow learners. So the Windsor Agreement seems Brexit for slow learners. For those who don't know, the Sunningdale Agreement was signed in 1973, established a power share in Northern Ireland um, executive, but also a Council of Ireland, which provided for 
I suppose, a role for the government of the Republic of Ireland and then was brought down, not least, by a massive strike organised by the Ulster Workers Council amidst escalating violence. And then you got, obviously, the Good Friday Agreement, which was twenty a quarter of a century later, which did many of the same things. I mean, does, does he have a point? Is this basically, again, that kind of a repetition of that kind of element of Northern Irish, that trauma of Northern Irish history, where what is you know, for tooth and nail um, with, off, well, in that case, brutal consequences. We haven't had that, for, unfortunately, in this case, but it just becomes the inevitable, just it takes a while to get there. Um, yeah, Dimitri had his thinking face. You're going to give me my resigned face at this point <laughs> when we talk about the history in those terms. Um, I suppose when you're a conflict like the Northern Ireland conflict, the four years up to the Sunning Deal Agreement put together a lot of the bare bones as to what a power sharing arrangement might look like. But those societal forces that were unleashed in the 1970s had not had an opportunity to play out. Yeah. And there were a lot of people who still thought there could be a zero sum win yep. in the territory of Northern Ireland, that it could be <laughs> completely unionist or it would be won over completely and there would be a united Ireland. Yeah. And the 1998 agreement was, as much as anything else, a recognition that, well, a lot of that energy had dissipated and there was a space for people to say, well, no, let's try to make cooperation on something between those extremes work. Now, if you look at today's agreement in another way, you've had seven years of intense animosity between the UK government and the EU playing out. And frankly, a lot of people have got bored of talking about Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland is tiny in terms of its significance to the EU single market. So the EU has a huge incentive to try to do a deal in these circumstances that gets a lot of these problems off the table at a time when, well, Ukraine is a much more pressing geopolitical concern for Europe. For Rishi Sunak, his position of strength, of strength is actually his weakness. He can face down the ERG at the moment because they know if they bring down Rishi Sunak, there will be a general election, which at the moment, as the polls go, will be a bloodbath for the Conservative Party. So he can call their bluff yeah. in a way that his predecessors either had had to cozy up tight to them to get their position or couldn't call their bluff because of the disastrous 2017 election performance. There is a window here where, yeah, because of the trust that's been put in place, particularly, as Dimitri said, through data sharing, that the EU can pivot and say, OK, we're willing to take a more risk-based approach mm. to these arrangements than we ever would have been able to countenance under yeah. the bluster of the Johnson administration. And it's that agreement from Sunak. We're going to give you all of the data so you can see in real time any problems that might be emerging that gives a protocol on a very different basis to the, no, we're going to tie you into this hard edge set of rules because we just don't trust who we're dealing with. Johnson iteration of the protocol. And I think that's is a really interesting development in British politics, which isn't remarked upon enough, which you've alluded to there, which is from 2010 onwards, the Tory Brexiteers ate up everyone. Uh, one by one, they ate up David Cameron, they ate up Theresa May, but in the end, they, they ended up eating up themselves. Uh, but you, it's quite a spectacular rise of the Tory Brexiteers. Um, but they peaked, I would suspect, around after the 2019 election, and it's been downhill ever since in quite a spectacular fashion. And but then, a lot of their most effective operators... Mm -hmm. Suella Braverman, mm -hmm. uh, Steve Baker, even Chris mm -hmm. Eaton Harris. All of these have been leading lights of the yep. ERG. They've all translated the personal status that that springboard gave them into high ministerial office. Their incentive to bring down the government disappears and you're left with, frankly, much less effective actors like Marc Francois mm -hmm. running the show. And it's not the same force as a result as it was historically. The ERG isn't the same threat, and Sunak is in a position to be able to call their bluff. It's a very astute observation. Colin, really, really appreciate your time and your thoughts. Really, really 
insightful stuff. Do follow Colin Murray on Twitter, by the way, at CRG Murray. Um, and I suspect he'll have many more things to say in the coming days as this agreement plays out. But honestly, Colin, such an honour to have you at such short notice. So thanks so much for joining us. Thanks so much, Owen. Take care of yourself. See you in a bit. Brilliant stuff. Always very lucky to have such brilliant experts coming to explain often very complicated um, elements of our tumult. <laughs> it has been a tumultuous few years. Um, so that was absolutely brilliant. And we didn't do the show yesterday, so I should have mentioned at the beginning because I was in Oxford with Bernie Sanders. Had a lovely evening with uh, the senator. Um, hoping either to have footage. I basically, I, I interviewed him on stage at the Oxford Playhouse. Um, I, either we'll, we'll put up footage of it. It was a Guardian Live event, so I guess the issue is just in terms of how we get the footage because um, even though I work for the Guardian, things are complicated in life. Otherwise, I'll do something with him down the line. But um, he's done this new book, which is very insightful. Um, we'll have, I'm sure, more stuff to come on, uh, well, we will, on Brexit because... Um, Clearly, the ramifications of Brexit extend far beyond what's happening in Northern Ireland. And I think, I mean, as Colin suggested, pointed out, um, it's not been easy for people to disentangle the consequences of Brexit from, for example, Ukraine and COVID. But as those subside, it will be more easy to pinpoint or to allocate responsibility and blame for the problems we're in to the particular Brexit deal that the Tories negotiated. I still think Boris Johnson has a chance of coming back after the May elections, um, which will be bad for the Tories. I think even a bloodbath by then. Just thought I've got to go because I'm going to go and meet uh, someone now. But in fact, they're going to ring my doorbell in about a minute, so I better hurry up. Thanks to Tad Campwell as ever. Thanks to Number Three. Thanks to David Bawata as ever. Um, we've got lots of videos throughout the week as ever. We've got lots of interesting interviews coming up as well. Um, so um, obviously join us and. Um, there was something else I was going to say. Yeah, we've got, we're going to talk documentaries. The reason we delayed doing that with lots of various factors, organisation and all the rest of it. Um, we've got loads of ideas sent to us on patreon.com forward slash own Joe's 84, which many of you sent through, which really appreciate. So we will get on that. Lots of very big ideas, including on Brexit, to be fair. That was a popular suggestion. Uh, but we will get on that. And yeah, lots of it. Press like, by the way, subscribe, leave comments. I always read your comments, including the angry ones and the ones... Um, which which are certainly speaking your mind, which I appreciate. Uh, thanks to our brilliant guests, as ever. Thanks for watching, everyone, or listening. If you're listening on the podcast, uh, you are loved. Always make sure you make that clear. And I will see you tomorrow. Lots of love, everyone. Take care.